Okay, welcome to lesson one on gravitational fields. Um, you might look at this slide and think, hang on a minute, that's not a gravitational field. But this is really um, just an introduction to fields because this is the first bit of the A2 course in fields. Um, but you already know quite a lot of things about fields, so we're just trying to link from where you're starting from. Here's a field that I'm sure you will have seen. You've probably drawn this out, maybe all the way back in year eight. You've drawn this magnetic field. But probably when you did it, you didn't really think about what it meant. It was just a pretty shape and something you could do with some iron filings. So now we're trying to actually um, talk about why it's drawn and what this shape tells you. Okay, so we're going to look at three sorts of fields. Magnetic fields, which are probably the most complicated, the most difficult one, where you really need some sort of understanding about uh, quite tricky three-dimensional ideas. Gravitational fields that we're starting with, simply because they're the easiest ones to understand certainly the ones that we're most familiar with the effects of, um, and electrical fields which are very similar to gravitational fields. So it's really important that you get a clear understanding of gravitational fields because that's how you'll understand electrical fields much easier. And they all have some things in common. So if we look at this field, um, you'll see it's drawn out with lines. Um, so the lines must have a meaning. Two things really we can tell about the lines. First thing, they have a direction. Okay, so there are no arrows on these lines. Perhaps we should have drawn arrows. Um, I just stole this picture from somewhere, but if we did have arrows, they're going from north to south. So the di direction that a north pole would move in. So these lines over here are going this way. Okay, and these lines are made of a combination of two forces, if you think about it. So if we make this reasonably simple, if I put a north pole here, now, there are two forces on it. Okay, If we forget all this bit of the magnet in here, there are two forces. There's a north pole here, that's repelling it. There's a south pole here, that's attracting it. The force of attraction is bigger than the force of repulsion, simply because it's closer to the south pole. So you add these two forces together in a vector sense, and we just draw, um, change the colour so that I can draw you some vectors. Let's go for a nice blue. So we've got this vector plus that vector, Okay, add those two vectors together, and we end up with a resultant in this direction. So it moves off in this direction. Of course, as it moves, the distance between the, this one and the other two poles changes, and therefore the direction of the force changes by the time you're over here, for example. You've got a repulsion from that north pole. You've got a bigger attraction to this north pole, so the direction is straight in here. Um, the other thing we can tell from this is that where the field lines are closest, that's where the field is strongest. Okay, So around the poles of a magnet, that's where the field is strong. As you get further away, these lines will get further and further apart. So if we apply the same idea to gravitational fields, okay, here's the Earth. Which way will the field be? Well, this is not the force on the North Pole anymore. Remember, like the Earth's got a magnetic field. We're now interested in the gravitational field. So if I put an object here, the field line just simply shows the direction of the force on that object. So it will always be towards the center of the Earth. Okay, You'll notice the arrows go down, because that's what down is, really. If you think about it, down is the direction of the force on an object. Obviously, down in Australia is different to down in England. Okay, It's always just towards the center of the Earth. Um, however, there is one very misleading thing about this diagram which is the st if you think about the strength of the field. So it might seem from this diagram that as you go further away, um, the field becomes how much weaker? Well, at some distance here, again, let me just change the pen colour so you can actually see it. So at some distance R from the centre, compared with some longer distance, let's say 2R from the centre, right? you might say, well, this is how far away the field strength, the field lines are here they're going to be twice as far apart here, so you might think the field would be half as strong. But of course there's a fundamental problem with this diagram, which is that we've drawn it in two dimensions, and of course space is a three-dimensional thing. Um, so we'll come back to that in a one sec. So, But at the same distance, they're equally spaced, so any distance here, so the field strength at any distance is the same. The arrows always go towards the Earth, so it tells us that the, that's the direction of the force, and the field lines are getting further apart, so the field is getting weaker. Okay, but 
if we try to draw this out in three dimensions, okay, this is quite a nice little diagram that just tries to draw it in three dimensions for you, you'll realise that if we take a little cone out of the um, those field lines, right, imagine the field lines coming out from this point like a spray paint from a gun. At this distance here, they're just spraying this part, but by the time we're twice as far away, this area has become four times as big. So the field lines are spaced out over four times the area. If you painted the whole area, the whole the paint layer would only be a quarter as thick. By the time you've gone three times as far away, it's only a ninth as thick. Okay, so we get this relationship. Okay, that at two distant at two um, distance units, you've got four area units. It's a quarter as strong at three distance units. It's only a ninth as strong at four distance units. Only a sixteenth as strong. Okay, this is probably the sim the most important three words in this whole um, area. This is called the inverse square law. If you're twice as far away, the field strength is only a quarter as strong. If you're three times as far away, it's only a ninth as strong. Okay, this idea led to Newton's um, law of gravitation. So he said, if there are two objects with masses m1 and m2 and the separation of their centers is r, this causes us quite a bit of confusion sometimes when we use r for it's the radius of the circle, if you like, that the field spread out of, not the radius of the object that's causing it. Um, but we know that the force is inversely proportional to the square of the separations and we know it also depends on the product of the masses. So if M2 is twice as mass, then there'll be twice as much force on it. If M1 has got twice the mass, it will cause twice as strong a gravitational field. Okay, Newton only got this far and said it was proportional. Okay, later on, somebody else managed to work out what this constant was to make it into an equal sign, which is the equation we use now. So this equation here tells us the force between two objects of mass m1 and m2 and a separation of r squared. Okay, the guy who worked out this constant um, was a guy called Henry Cavendish. Uh, just a little bit after Newton died, he did this experiment, which always seems quite um, remarkable, really, that he managed to do this. So what he did is he got some um, large lead spheres, and he ha he put some smaller lead spheres on a bar and he held them on a torsion wire and it actually managed to measure the attraction that twisted this slightly um, to pull the masses together. Okay, his big masses were about, you'll see different numbers, but about 160 kilograms. Of course, he wasn't using kilograms at the time because he was in England, so it was still all pounds and ounces and foot pounds and lots of crazy units you don't need to worry about. Uh, the small mass is 0.71 kilograms. The masses were 210 millimeters apart. This is the separation, so this is why you need to use lead so you can make get a relatively large mass in a relatively small object, so it's nice and dense. Otherwise, um, obviously, the maximum, the minimum distance you can have is the actual size of the balls. And the remarkable thing is he managed to measure this force despite the fact it was less than a millionth of a newton. If you put the numbers in for that calculation. Okay, then if you rearrange the equation we had before, we had um, F equals G M 1 M 2 over R squared. So he um, worked out G was F R squared over M 1 M 2. Put the numbers in and you get a number around 6.75 times 10 to the minus 11. Okay, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 is a number that we use now in order to work out the force between two objects because of the force of gravity between them. Um, he actually didn't call this working out Newton's gravitational constant. He said it was a way to weigh the Earth. Okay, This is way used in a rather tricky sense that uh, causes us some confusion really to find the mass of the Earth. We probably would rather he said. Um, so what did he do? Well, he said that the force was mg, g, m1, m2 over r squared. So the gravitational field of the Earth was g, m, e over r squared. If just simply dividing both sides here, m2 is the one we normally think of as being the one that's being pulled, and m1 is the one that's doing the pulling. So this is m2 here. 
So this gives us the gravitational field of the Earth is g times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth squared. Okay, the radius of the Earth was well known, and we know if we use our current units that one kilogram weighs 9.81 newtons. Um, so if you just rearrange that equation, that gives you the mass of the Earth as 9.81 times the radius of the Earth, 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters squared, divided by the value for g, big G, the gravitational constant, which gives us 6.02 times 10 to the 24 kilograms.